Hey everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And I have a very curious follow-up from a story I talked about yesterday. In addition to kind of looking at, do we really trust what we read in regards to online media about the cryptocurrency space? I have a little bit of information on that as well. So yesterday's article, it came out about a day ago from the block. And there were two writers, Frank Shaparo and Isabel Woodford. And they wrote that Thailand's richest company is going to acquire the firm behind Omise Go Token for about $100 million. That firm is Thailand's largest private company, and it's called the CP Group. Well, soon after this story came out, the founder of Omisego said, no way, this is absolutely false. The article, the block published on acquisitions of Omise Payment Gateway is false. We have reached out to the block and to rectify the article and take the necessary actions. So this is created, of course, a lot of controversy. Well, I went digging around and I found that the writer, Frank, says that he has five airtight sources with no agenda, and each one of those sources are separate from each other behind this story. As a matter of fact, he went on to tweet that he stands behind his reporting and that his tweet uh, that June did uh, was deleted. Now, I don't know because I, I could still find it, but Maybe he did delete it and then retweet it again. I'm not sure, but the second tweet from Frank says, notice his treat, tweet has been deleted. And then lastly, he said uh, he stands by his extensive sourcing. So who is Frank? Well, he got his start with the Business Insider. He writes about digital assets, Wall Street, market structures, financial technology, uh, he's also done a lot of breaking stories on firms such as Fidelity, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, and NASDAQ. And then the co-writer is Isabel Woodford, and she is the Block's London and European reporter. She previously reported for Reuters in Madrid and London following her time as a freelance journalist for The Guardian and The New York Times. She has a bachelor's in war studies from King's College London, and a Master's of Philosophy from the University of Oxford. I think both of these writers would be very careful to put their name on something they didn't feel sure about. And if we look at the original funding that Omise received back in 2016, they were able to secure a round of funding of 17.5 million. Now it's interesting that there were four investors. It was led by SBI Group here in Japan, but look at this. One of the investors was Ascend Money. So Ascend Money is actually owned by the CP Group and the other main shareholder is Ant Financial. And this Ascend Money did $5 billion in total volume for payments in 2017. They were actually up 400% year on year and growth compared to their uh, financials in 2016. So you can see that uh, the company CP Group since they are in this space, and Omise is very successful in Thailand. Uh, they have some users also in Singapore, Indonesia, and Japan, but it seems as though they would be an obvious uh, group to acquire them since they've already made an initial investment. They're a huge powerhouse. They're in this space. This is the time where we are going to see very, very big strategic moves. And I think this is one of them that's happening, but we still need to wait and see. All right. So can we believe what we read? There is a journalist out there, Crane Faith, who did a story and some research and found 
some really kind of shocking news. 22 outlets that were contacted were willing to publish paid content without disclosing it, meaning they were willing to publish articles and not show that it was uh, being paid as content. Even two hinted that they would probably do it. So if you bring that total to 14 out of 22, it's like 58% of these online media companies are willing to do that. And here is a chart she put together so you can come down and take a look at some of the sources. I'm positive you recognize many of these like Coin Intelligence, Coin Speaker, Crypto Potato Block, there's AMB uh, Crypto. And this is the pricing for their paid content. And some of them, like the Bitcoinist, goes into the thousands of dollars to provide that service. Now, the terrible thing is that these writers get approached uh, often to do this kind of um, article writing. And here is an example of an email that was sent out uh, by a, somebody by the name of Mark. The name is, last name is blacked out. So he wanted to have an article about an ICO and a crypto cover three companies. And he was willing to give good money for that. He said over a thousand dollars. I know that good bloggers never intend to receive money due to their reputation, but I need your help and have to ask you to consider this offer. Well, the offer was declined, but it's not rare for these media companies to post actually what the cost is for their sponsored work. So here is um, Block Onomi, and you can see that for a sponsored post, if you would like them to write an in-depth review or um, guide to your product or about the company, they offer that service and they can do a turnaround within 48 hours and they can promote it on their Twitter and Facebook accounts and include uh, the newsletter, which goes out to 5,000 readers. And the post will also appear on their notification system with alerts of over 10,000 people instantly to new posts. So it's not uncommon, but I think that the sad thing is, is that these media outlets will write something and not disclose it's being written as paid content. And here you can see that this person contacted Bitcoinist and uh, wanted to know that in that coverage, if it's written about them, um, he was letting them know that some would like to not be marked sponsored. Is that possible? And the reply was, yes, that's possible with an extra 20% on the price. So it's really disheartening to think that there is so much of this out there because uh, we start to really wonder what we can believe and what we can't believe. So now I think I'm already going to jump to the fluff. And the first picture I want to show you is of an Edo period newspaper seller who is actually in costume. It's kind of like a, um, oh, when you do reenactment. There's a lot of reenactment in Japan, and they're in the form of festivals. They're very fun to go to. And this, this gentleman is dressed up as a newspaper seller. And the newspaper sellers in the Edo period would always have one of these sticks, and they would point to the article and give you the headline or maybe tell you something like the form of clickbait to get you to buy the paper itself, which was done through block printing. And the block printing was done all through that period uh, from 1600 to, gosh, the mid 1800s. So if I take you back to here, this is actually an image of a real newspaper from the Edo period. It is about a earthquake and fire that occurred. And actually, I'm not sure as to what part of Japan this was, but this at least gives you an idea of what the papers look like. And the um, 
block printing for the artwork was very nice, actually, even though the story is not so nice, but the artwork itself was very nice. And I wanted to share with you that in that reenactment, there are so many towns that have a yearly festival. And this is the one that occurs in Shinagawa. And if I just do a tiny, tiny bit, you can see that this is all modern day Tokyo and people are dressing up in the Edo. This is interesting. Do you see this woman here? She has her kimono sleeve off and she's holding a bamboo cup. This was in Edo period, the, the way that the um, women who ran gambling halls would wear their kimono. So you could, you could uh, trust them. They, they didn't have dice hidden in their sleeves. So they would bring their sleeve down like that and then um, use that cup to throw the dice. And the um, people of that time in history love to bet on dice. That was one of the big gambling, uh, you know, types of gambling that was done. So anyway, this is kind of fun. You can find a lot of this on YouTube. This is um, very close to where I live, just like literally t not even 10 minutes away. Um, here's here. Now these are, if I go, mm, these are some samurai, but if I go back to this picture, these are little wind chimes called furin, glass wind chimes. They sound so beautiful. They actually are to sound like the ice in a glass to make you feel cool in the heat of summer. Yeah, so these are the Edo period sellers of the hand-blown glass wind chimes. And it's really fun. Here there's, they have a exhibition of, um, here's some people doing a pilgrimage and uh, I think this is part of the um, the local, maybe, I don't know, policeman, policewoman of the year. I'm not sure. And everybody's dressed up in all different types of class and different merchants. I think there is one, yeah, here's uh, like a flower, a, a very much a, a seller of flowers. There was so much happening on the streets of Edo. That's where... There's the newspaper guy there. So much of the trade and business was done on the streets at that time. Not always in a store, but but a lot of business transact, transacted on the street. This guy is probably carrying uh, rice. Anyways, it's just so fun. I really hope if you come to Japan, you can time it right. You can see one of these reenactments. But the big star of these reenactments are these women here called the Oriran. They are the courtesans of the day. And actually, well, I will tell you that in Kyoto, there are still uh, just a handful. So the Oriran were a special class of women who were very skilled in um, conversation. Uh, many of them had uh, skills in tea ceremony and also in um, calligraphy, also ikebana, which would be uh, the art of arranging flowers. Um, they were really great at entertaining and they would uh, be quite famous for entertaining men, of course. Now they're different than geisha. Don't don't get it confused. This is totally not uh, a geisha. They these women were really in the business of, um, of entertainment. Yes. Okay. So, but in doing so, they would become celebrities within their own districts too. So they were the highest class, the educated class of the women who were in this kind of business. And yeah, it's the oldest business in the world, right? So they were the highlights in the Edo period during these festivals as they are still the highlights today. And I want to show you how they parade because they are, they move very interestingly, very slowly, and 
it's almost as if they're dancing. The reason why they are moving this way is they are on a shoe or a getta that is 15 centimeters high. You can see here that she is walking there. Do you see that? So 15 centimeters is about six inches high and they would slide their foot over in this fashion as a way to parade down the Hanamichi. And people would come from everywhere to see them because they were very famous. It's really great. And I want to show you a picture of one in a vintage photograph. This is a real Orion with the Kamaro, yeah, the girls who are always, the young girls who are always in attendance. Now, some of these girls were in circumstances in their life that they were found themselves having to pay back family debts or what have you. It wasn't necessarily a profession you strived to do, but um, life deals out some difficult hands sometimes, and they were able to achieve the highest rank within that entertainment business. And you can see, look at all the people just wanting to catch a glimpse. They were really quite famous. Now, what's very interesting is still in Kyoto, and only in Kyoto, these uh, women are still in existence in a district called Shimabara and just a handful and they are I don't know how long they can keep it going because in that area of Kyoto there's um, really adorable cute Michael san who the apprentice geisha who you just cannot miss when you go but if you are really lucky you'll be able to catch a glimpse of one of the Orion amazing these are kanzashi, which are quite elaborate hairpins, which signify or which you can you can really if you if you um, do any research on your own, you'll be able to distinguish the difference between the geisha and the orion, and also their obis are quite different, and the whole kimono is quite different too as well. And last but not least, in that district in Kyoto. This in the Shimabara district, this is the last surviving tea house, which is still open. So we are seeing uh, the pressures of the modern world on Japan. And that's why you need to come to Japan and go to Kyoto before it's all gone. It's really quite special. All right, everybody, I better let you go. So that's all I have for you today. Sayonara for now. Take care. Bye-bye.